No, I never stop working. I always keep churning stuff out, mainly but these days for pleasure more than anything else. I'm, I suppose I'm technically retired, age 76, but I still go on writing the odd song. I make quite a lot of free online films that have done very, very well. The first one I made, which is called Vile Pervert, the musical, which is free to watch online and just crossed four million full length views uh, and loads of others as well. Uh, one called Me, Me, Me movie, uh, another one called The Pink Marble Egg. And they're all musicals, basically, but full of uh, amusing bits and information and entertainment. So I do that and I still I've still got my, my company still exist, obviously, because all my copyrights still, I'm glad to say, earn money, including money from people like 10CC and Genesis and the Bay City Rollers and the Rocky Horror Show and all the things I was involved in back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So, yes, I, I'm still quite involved in all those things. Uh, I took the old country song by B.J. Thomas, who sadly died recently, and uh, I, I thought it needed a pop treatment. So I came up with this idea of male voices grunting and going, ooga jaga, ooga ooga, ooga jaga, ooga ooga, ooga ooga, ooga jaga, ooga ooga, ooga jaga, ooga ooga, ooga jaga, ooga ooga, ooga jaga, ooga ooga. I can't stop this feeling. Deep inside of me Girl, you just don't realize What you do to me In a sort of reggae rhythm And I made it and it came out It was a small hit I think it was top 20 around most countries And about three or four years later I got a call from this gentleman called Bjorn Skiffs in Sweden Saying Jonathan, uh, I've got this silly little group called Blue Sweet that hasn't sold any records, but we loved your version of, of uh, Hooked on a Feeling. Would you mind if we covered it? You know, because he wanted to cover it exactly as I'd done it rather than as the country thing. I said, no, feel free. Thinking, you know, look, you get a number one in Sweden, you earn enough just about to fill your Rolls Royce with petrol once, you know. Uh, anyway, he covered it. Uh, and a few months later, I get a call from a friend of mine called Al Khoury, who was the head of promotion at Capitol Records in America. It was a very good friend. And he said, Jonathan, I always thought your Hooked on a Feeling should have been a big hit in America. I was distributed in America through London Records, who were, I have to admit, fairly useless and broke very few of my records. One of the others they actually broke was Beach Baby by First Class, uh, talking of Honolulu, always reminds me of that. Uh, and I said, uh, yeah, and he said, well, we've got this cover of your old Hooked on a Feeling, and I, I want to release it. I think we can turn it into a hit, but uh, I won't do it if you'd be offended, you know, if, if, you, know, if you feel you should have had the hit. <laughs> I said, no, no, feel free. And he released it and it went to number one and sat there for weeks and weeks. The one pleasure I kind of made no money out of it. You don't make any money out of an arrangement. So my ooga jungle, ooga ooga, made me no money at all. And it was used in everything. It's been in Guardians of the Galaxy. It was on that, that, um, that dancing baby and Ally McBeal. It's been everywhere. But I never made a penny out of it. Um, except my record does keep selling, I'm glad to say. Uh, and the one pleasure I had was there was a, a well-known DJ in America who was also a good friend of mine who used to do the syndicated Top 40 show all over the States called Casey Kasem. You may remember him. And every time he got to number one and he said, well, at number one, it's Blue Swede with Hooked on a Feeling, but I'm going to play you the original by my friend Jonathan King and played my original. That gave me great satisfaction. I know Simon, both Simon Fuller and Simon Cowell very well. Simon Cowell much better, but I know Simon Fuller well, a very nice man. It's funnily enough, when Simon Cowell came up with the idea for a pop idol, it was having I I'd be I was asked by uh, by the TV people to be the first judge on a show called Pop Stars. 
uh, and I turned it down for two reasons. One, I'd done all that before, back in the days of jukebox jury and everything. And I know I, I am very, very old. It's just I look incredibly young and cherubic. Anyway, I didn't want to do it for that reason. But the main reason I didn't want to do it is they were filming the first series at the same time as the Baseball World Series was happening, which featured my two New York teams, the Mets and the Yankees, in, I think, 1999 or 2000 or around then. So I said, no, I, I, I won't do the job. And they panicked and said, well, who else can we have? And I said, well, I suggest Simon Cowell. So they approached Simon Cowell, and uh, he took their listen to them. They offered him quite a lot of money, though nowhere near as much as they'd offered me. And Simon called me and said, should I do it? And I said, I wouldn't if I were you, because they'll have full control over the music and the music will be shit and your reputation will be bad. So he turned it down. And in fact, the, the gig was taken by Nigel Lithgow, who was then the executive producer at the time, was also a friend of mine. Simon then came up with his stupid idea for Pop Idol, one person instead of a group, which I thought was mad. Asked my advice about it. By that time, I was going through the turmoil of the police case, and Simon actually was my bail. He put up £50,000 as my bail bond. And I said, Simon Cowell, yeah. And I said to Simon, uh, hang on, you need somebody who knows about television. And he said, well, who? And I said, well, go and visit my friend Simon Fuller. So Carl went to see Fuller and they then linked up and that started the whole franchise that became American Idol and the X Factor and everything else, although they did fall out after a bit. But that was the beginning of the whole thing. I just sat back and watched it in my prison cell. What you don't know was that at the end of the 1990s, I had many meals with Eric Nikolai, just as a passing observer, and he offered me the global chairmanship of EMI at approximately five million quid a year. And I decided to accept it, and I did accept it, so the deal was done. Then, unfortunately, my life took an interesting turn. Surrey police arrived on my doorstep for no good reason. Someone had made false allegations about me and my entire career changed tack. Uh, since then, I've heard many, many people say that actually it was all organized by a man called Max Clifford, a rather dodgy PR person who had as its... Yes, who had as his friend, um, uh, and also, funny enough, it was me that advised Simon Cowell to go with him, but that's a separate story. But I, I was heard rumours that one of the people who had said to him, if you can get Jonathan King done for anything, we'd be very grateful, was a friend of his who was a lady, who was actually a lady uh, executive married to the then top executive of EMI in America, who I had urged Eric Nikolai to get rid of because it was being completely useless in the States. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But that's a rumour that's reached me over the last few years. And I'm still fighting it. I'm still 20 years later appealing against it. I was found guilty. I would, they recently tried again, and I was then found not guilty on all charges. And the good thing about that was all sorts of fresh evidence came out proving the original conviction had been unsafe. So that's what's being considered at the moment. I've been, ha I've been lucky enough to have a lot of success in lots of areas, and I think it's difficult to say. I'm a sort of jack of all trades and master of none, so I tend to dip my finger into a lot of things. I think probably my proudest moment was when I took over producing the Brits, which is the British equivalent of the Grammys, and I managed to persuade the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, to hum or sing for me, her favourite song of all time. And I couldn't believe it when I caught her on camera. And when we showed it and it went out, the, the reaction was unbelievable because there was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom singing, how much is that doggy in the window, the one with the waggly tail? I thought to myself, if I'm going to have something carved on my gravestone, this is it.
son of Lotus Cane's head to green Mouth full of chocolate Covered cream Arms that can only Lift a spoon Everyone's gone to the moon Everyone's gone to the moon Yes, it was actually the very first pop record ever to go to the moon. One of the astronauts took it as his choice, the one who just died recently again. Uh, he chose it to take it to the moon. So, yes, it was the first pop song ever to go to the moon. Um, yes, I made it. I wrote it when I was a teenager. I recorded. I was very lucky. It went to number one all over the world, sold just under 10 million copies. Um, and it launched me as a producer, which is what I really wanted to be, as a songwriter and as a singer. And I was therefore able to build a career out of it before I'd even reached the age of 21. And it was quite fun as well, because all my friends and contemporaries then were slightly older than me, but people like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix and all these people who were like my school chums, as it were, and we mixed. And the memories I have of those happy days in the 60s and the 70s were unbelievable and remain great to this day. But now I just move forwards and get on with life as it is in 2021. Yes, it was my friend Camilla who runs Pop Pitch. We email and correspond every day or so. Uh, she's a really good friend. And at one point she mentioned that you had this contest and she said, you really should put a song in for it. And I thought, yeah, I've got one that will be absolutely perfect. I'm over you. All about people falling in love with big celebrities. But the trouble with heroes is they often turn into zeros. And I thought, well, I'd stick it in. So there you have as one of my Entries to your wonderful contest, uh, I'm Over You. Yeah, many of us oldies are still at it, doing our own different thing. And what you have to remember is what I've always specialised in is mass appeal music, crossover music. The last couple of really big hits I was involved with were Who Let the Dogs Out? Who Let the Dogs Out? Who And I get knocked down, but I get up again. Um, I tend to go for tracks that end up selling 16, 17 million copies and not the specialist hits, a lot of which are very good, but that actually only appeal to a tiny specialist audience. Well, that's really not my area. I don't look after that. I look after crossover mass appeal hit. That's why when I took over Eurovision for the UK, it took me three years, but we ended up winning with Katrina and the Waves. And the UK has not won Eurovision since. Um, so I'm, I'm a populist. I go for things that I think will appeal to millions and millions of people. I'm not fooled by the fact that some obscure rapper gets billions of streams, because we all know streams cost virtually nothing. And curiosity is a good way to get lots of streams, but not actually a good way to really appeal people and to be important in people's lives. I'm very much in the era where music is an absolute necessity. It's like food, drink and air. Music is there. Now, to many people in the music world now, and as I just told you, I would have been running EMI, which would still be a very successful worldwide British company if I'd actually taken that gig. Um, but these days, most of the people running the music industry regard it as a sort of luxury. And they therefore make small amounts of money. I mean, even people like Adele and Ed Sheeran and Dua Lipa and so on are staggered by the tiny amounts of money they make compared to the money that we used to make. You know, I'd have a small hit. I remember I had a hit with a song called Chickaboom. Boom, chicka boom, don't 
Chickaboom, chickaboom, don't you just love it? Under the name 53rd and 3rd back in the early 70s. And it crept into number 36 on the top 40 for one week. And I checked a few months ago, just out of interest, I checked how much money I'd made from that one small single worldwide. A million quid. Because I obviously wrote and published the B-side, I was the singer, I owned the rights, I was the producer, so I owned the copyright. And even though it only made 36 on the chart, it went on to every compilation. And those days, compilations used to sell like crazy. And you'd have the 50 greatest hits from the UK released every year on k -tel and you know that's what I call music and all those things around the world and every country would pick up on it and even if it wasn't a hit in Australia or Hong Kong it would be on compilations there and the net result was out of this silly little song which I didn't even write and publish the A side of I made around a million quid now that's probably what Ed Sheeran and Dua Lipa have made in their entire career so far the world has changed Well, it would be exactly that, right? A mass appeal song, a crossover song that grandmothers will like, small children will like, you know. I mean, it's, it isn't difficult. It, it's very simple, very catchy. Um, I, I always I remember when I first heard, which, which was on a float in the Caribbean, who let the dogs out? And I thought, it's going to, everybody, grandmothers, children, parents, aunts, uncles, girlfriends, boyfriends, they're all going to be singing, who let the dogs out? Woof, woof. And indeed they did. As you have now found out, I tend to be involved in a lot of things or choose to be involved in a lot of things. Now, who knows what's going to happen with the contest? I, um, I suspect I probably won't win your contest and somebody else win. But, but it's always worth trying and going in for these things. And that's what I do. If I hear a song I think is a hit, I get on to the people who made it and said, would you like me involved? And I can turn this into a hit for you if you like. And quite often, nobody else hears it. It's very, things like those tracks are tracks that nobody likes in the industry because they break all the rules, you know. Um, as you said earlier, they're not hip hop or garage or current tracks, you know. They're not Black Lives Matter or Me Too. They don't fit into any of the current categories. And most of the people running the music industry worldwide have actually no ears at all. I look like I've got no ears myself, but um, they've got no ears at all. And they wouldn't hear a, a crossover mass appeal hit if they could, if it was played to them. So all they listen to is, does it sound like the current number one? Or better, does it sound like the current number two? Or does it sound like the current number three? And I never go, that way i always go hey this could appeal to millions and millions of people who don't normally like or buy or download or stream music that's what i'll make thank you very much and so i make these very catchy instant songs and some of them a tiny percentage i have to say most of my of my projects don't do a thing um, but some of them really break it big that's the difference with me. It's either really nothing happening or absolutely massive things happening. I mean, I discovered it's not generally known because I used to record, as you know, under various different names. Uh, and I was told recently that I'd, I'd actually, as a singer, sold 40 million records. Now that's quite a quite an achievement for somebody who most people have never heard of. But I was the lead singer on this, I was the lead singer on that, and 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 I had a few under my own name, like Everyone's Gone to the Moon and Una Paloma Blanca and a few others. And eventually it mounts up. 